Hello, and thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about zirconium in rutile thermometry. Now the way that we've set up this talk is that I'm first going to talk about zirconium and rutile calibrations, and then Kaylee Harvey will talk to you about practicalities of zirconium and rutile thermometry, and then Buchanan's going to finish up with some software development. Okay, zirconium in rutile is a great thermometer, simple reaction, ZRO2 tetragonal form in rutile, uh, alpha quartz reacts to form uh, zircon. Here's calibration from Tompkins et al., one that I think most of us use. And why is it so good? Rutile zircon and a silica polymorph are common, and even if you don't have a silica polymorph, you can calculate the activity of quartz from these three minerals. Sarah Peniston Dorland et al. showed this in 2018. It's very precise to within a few degrees, especially using laser ablation ICPMS. And it's accurate, it has an experimental calibration, although, as I'll show you, that can be improved a bit. To put us all on the same page, this is a pressure versus temperature diagram showing the region of pressure temperature space of relevance to calibrating the zirconium and UTL thermometer. Most of the experiments are up here. This region is below the closure temperature of zirconium diffusion in a rutile core. And this temperature is above a range a region where Schulacher et al. have reported some unusual compositions. The reaction is based on alpha quartz, this stability field, so experiments that are in here or uh, ultra-high pressure rocks um, have to be corrected for the activity of alpha quartz outside its stability field. Um, so in terms of calibrations, these are the data of Watts et al. Et al. That's the first calibration. The red stars are the experiments of uh, Helen Tompkins et al. And that's what gives rise to this expression that I think most of us use. Um, Amy Hoffman et al. published some experiments in 2013, and they post-dated calibration, so they haven't been used previously. The, um, so what did I do? I added the data of Hoffman et al., and then I also added natural data where the PT conditions were determined from either mineral assemblage diagrams or independent thermometers and barometers. None of the temperatures were based on zirconium and UTL thermometry. And I used the highest reported zirconium contents. I used a bootstrap regression for calibrations. We don't have to go into the details right now, but it turns out it's less sensitive to outliers, makes fewer assumptions, and I, I believe it gives a more realistic assessment of errors. This was published earlier this year in American Mineralogist. So if you look at the modeled temperature versus measured temperature for the original Watson et al. experiments, then what you find is that the low pressure experiments and the low pressure rocks, they're modeled with too high a temperature, whereas the high pressure experiments and high pressure rocks are modeled with too low a temperature. If you look at the Tompkins et al. calibration, you find that their calibration does a much better job. Um, however, it does not fit uh, the data of uh, Hoffman at all, so they are predicted to be 75 degrees C lower, and rocks are predicted to be 50 degrees C higher than they actually are. So the new calibration, um, there's an experimental only calibration using these experiments. It does a great job. There's about a 10 degree C uh, deviation from the average of the rock uh, temperatures, and the combined model, obviously it's going to fit the rock data uh, better. They give almost identical temperatures. The, the only reason that I prefer the combined model is that um, it more accurately represents natural data, um, and so the errors are correspondingly smaller. Okay, now I'm going to turn this over to Kaylee, and she's going to talk to you about the practicalities of choosing rutile compositions for calculating temperatures. So in an ideal world, rutile from a single sample or from a single textural or chemical domain within a sample, such as inclusions in garnet or matrix rutile, would all record the exact same zirconium concentration. However, in real life, it's not quite that straightforward, and oftentimes what you end up with are samples that record a wide range of zirconium concentrations. Uh, for example, this one, which ranges from about 150 ppm all the way up to 520 ppm. Um, and that difference in zirconium concentration corresponds to a difference in temperature of about 100 degrees Celsius. Which really begs the question, how do we actually define a zirconium concentration to use to determine a petrologically meaningful temperature? 
Um, and there have been a couple of uh, approaches to define peak temperatures uh, throughout the years, uh, and those include using things like the maximum concentration, uh, which I would urge you not to, to do, or using methods like a box and whisker plot and using an upper quartile as your peak estimate, or averaging the highest concentration gradients in your sample, um, which is this mean maximum zirconium method. Um, and oftentimes, you will get approximately the same answer uh, using the mean maximum zirconium concentration versus using an upper quartile concentration. Um, however, there are cases like the sample that I'm showing here where that's not the case which really begs the question, uh, is there a better approach and a more reliable approach to statistically identify and separate rutile populations um, in a petrologically meaningful way? Um, and we, to do this, we've actually drawn inspiration from the geochronology community, where um, a, a number of geochronologists will use uh, finite Gaussian mixture models to unmix age populations. Um, so I have an example of a uranium lead age population here. Um, you can see that this has a non-Gaussian distribution and it may be tempted, tempting to just apply a weighted mean to calculate an average age. Um, but when we calculate a sum probability distribution, you can see that there are two distinct age peaks. We can unmix those age peaks using a finite Gaussian mixture model. Um, and when we do, we can see that we have one group within the sample that records an age of about 17.02 million years. Um, and then we have a second group which records an age, the younger age of about 16.95 million years. And this type of mixing model is applicable to other data sets other than just geochronology data. Um, so now I'm going to apply it to the same zirconium and rutil data set with the goal of defining a peak metamorphic temperature. Um, so I'm starting with just a histogram showing the distribution of zirconium concentrations throughout the sample. And then we apply our summed probability distribution. Um, you can see that this starts to get a little bit messy. Um, and then when we actually apply the finite Gaussian mixing model, we can now see that there are five discrete peaks with a maximum peak of about 476 ppm. Uh, and that's plus or minus 20 ppm. And you can see that that actually compares quite well to our mean maximum zirconium concentration. Although because we are um, utilizing statistical averaging, we've now reduced our uncertainty by about 73 ppm, uh, which cor corresponds to reducing the uncertainty in the temperature by about 10 degrees Celsius. Just to give a last plug before I think, turn things over to Buchanan to actually demonstrate how we do these calculations, uh, this was an approach that we actually developed um, or repurposed in order to determine peak metamorphic pressures um, from quartz and garnet data. Um, and that was just recently published in the journal Metamorphic Geology. And, and this is just a plug to really highlight that this isn't just applicable to geochronology data or to the kind of retail data. This is really applicable to a, a large range of, of petrologic data sets and, and geochemical data sets. Um, and with that, I will turn things over to Buchanan, who is going to, to show you how we actually do these calculations um, using a new R-based application that he developed. My name is Buchanan Kerswell. I work with Matthew Cohen at Boise State University. And now I'm going to give you a very, very quick demonstration of our app. We built this app to do two things primarily. First, we wanted an elegant way to visualize and explore one-dimensional data sets. And second, we want to be able to ask the question, are there subgroups within a particular data set? And before I begin, I just want to make a couple quick acknowledgments. This app was built using the Isoplot R package. If you would like more information about the Isoplot R package, please refer to Vermeesh, 2018. And the data set we're going to be exploring today comes from Trailer Law 2020. These are uh, uranium lead zircon ages from the Santa Cruz Formation, which is a stratigraphic sequence in Argentina. OK. So here are our data. So I'm going to ask the question, are there subgroups within this data set? So there are different ways to explore the data set. You can plot the data like this. I happen to know that these data are ordered in stratigraphic sequence. So these data, these data, these data, 
these data and these data all come from different stratigraphic units. And we can infer that from their ages, uh, where this would be the lowest stratigraphic unit, the oldest ages, and these have the youngest ages, so they'd be coming from the highest stratigraphic unit. We can visualize the data set in a familiar way by plotting a histogram. We can adjust the bin width to get a better sense of this. And you can see there's quite a complicated age distribution here. Um, we can choose to look at different probability density functions, including the normal, a kernel, a sum PDF, some PDF visualized in a different way, and as individual Gaussian peaks for each individual measurement. Now, the sum PDF is essentially each one of these individual measurements modeled as an individual Gaussian peak summed up. So you can imagine going across the x-axis and just summing all of these curves up and what we ultimately get is a probability distribution that looks like this. So we can infer from this distribution that we likely have some clusters of ages in here. Maybe one here, maybe a few here, here, here. Now I'm going to ask the question, where are these clusters of ages, and how well do we know those clusters? To do this, I'm going to apply a finite Gaussian mixture model. If you'd like more information on finite Gaussian mixture models, there's lots of good information online. We do that by going to our Gaussian mixture model tab, automatically applies the algorithm, finds our peaks. So I hope this quick demonstration got you interested in this tool. If you would like more information, please contact me or one of the other authors, Matt or Kaylee. Thank you very much. Okay, to sum up, um, the calibrations do seem to explain more data better. Um, the experimentally combined calibrations give nearly identical temperatures. Really, the main difference is that the uh, combined calibration is, in my view, uh, more accurate. And as far as actually defining a zirconium concentration to calculate your temperature from, make sure that whatever you use is consistent with your petrologic model. Uh, as we've demonstrated, it's relatively straightforward to define a maximum zirconium concentration, but defining parts of the prograde or retrograde PT pass can be a bit more complicated. Uh, and I think that it's a good idea, no matter the data set, to actually visualize your data in such a way that you can identify and separate individual populations that wouldn't be obvious from petrography alone. And we'd like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for funding this research. Thanks.